Have you ever been afraid of the dark? As you've grown up, you've no doubt discovered that's what light is for. Illuminating, eliminating, destroying the darkness. But it's not just the physical, literal darkness that can cause fear. And it's not just little children who are afraid of the unknown. When it feels dark, when we find ourselves facing the unknown, when things are uncertain, when, when we're afraid of what might be around the next corner, like the darkness is closing in on you, when, when it feels like we're surrounded by difficulties, by problems, by troubles, let me remind you, you are surrounded it's true, but, but as a believer, you are not surrounded by your enemy. The, the father of lies, he who is against you, would fill your mind with all sorts of calamity and problems. He'd love to fill your mind and your words with dark, discouraging, fear-activating lies. But the truth is, and what we need to be reminded of, is we're surrounded by the presence and the power of the living God. He's the light of the world, the one who is for us, close to us, and on our side. In the next few minutes, I want to help you take your next step in living the fearless life that you were designed to live, the life Jesus came to give. It was Jesus who said, I've come to give you life, and that life to the full, the very best life. It's his desire for us, for you. Uh, that life is found in pointing your faith in the right direction, as we learned in week number one. That, that life, that abundant life, that great life is found in speaking words of life, as we learned in week number two. And that fearless life is found as we tap into and turn on the, the light, the power of prayer. Because inside that power that all believers are given, we find the help we need to truly live fearless. Welcome to week number three of our teaching series designed to help you live the kind of fearless life you were built for. If you missed uh, either of the two previous sessions, you can find those on our YouTube channel or on demand at thepointchurch.ca. If you're listening in on Facebook right now, you be sure and hit that like button for me, will you? And I'll leave a little comment below as well. And if you're one of the hundreds of people who now join us each week from all over on our YouTube channel, a quick thumbs up just below the video and then a comment in in the comment section under the video, not just off on the sidebar chat, but, but under the video in that comment section. It really helps us get this message of help and hope out to more people, allowing us to show up stronger in the YouTube algorithms. You go ahead, hit that thumbs up right now. And if you're watching on the big screen in your living room and you don't see anywhere to comment or anything around you, you go to your computer computer or your phone later on and smash that thumbs up for me, will you? But right now, let me do something for you. Let me help you live fearless. Surveys reveal that more than half of our society pray daily. And even 20% of those who consider themselves irreligious or religiously unaffiliated admit to whispering a quick prayer at least daily, often out of need, worry, or desperation. So many of us, we say we believe in the power of God and in the power of prayer. When we say we believe, it can make a difference. In times of tragedy, people ask for prayer, right? Or assure others of their prayer. 
And then there's the critics of prayer who increasingly show up even in those times of tragedy saying, well, what we need here is we, we don't need any more prayer. We need policy changes. We need government to do something. We need change. Still others promise to send good vibes our way in the midst of our difficulties and problems. Nice, but if you listen to either the critics or the mystics with those good vibes, we, we see quickly that many of us have a terribly confused understanding of prayer and the incredible power available to every believer. Have you ever noticed, you, you yourself, that so often we pray our best prayers. We cry out to God best and most authentically in our own moments of desperation rather than in the moments of celebration. A quick praise God seems to suffice when things work out, but when they don't, we can get pretty real with God. We get down on our knees, shaking our fists, yelling, falling on our faces even. When we see our need for God to intervene, when things go wrong, we call out to him. Have you ever been in a broken relationship with someone who just won't talk, who won't tell you what's wrong, who thinks you should know what's wrong? We just wish and we want for them to say something, anything, even something mean and nasty, hurtful, so at least we can know what went wrong. We can try to fix it. And yet, when we think about all these things I've just mentioned, we wonder why the God who loves us and who wants our attention, even as any loving parent would want, we wonder why he even allows us to go through so much darkness, so many difficulties, such fear-filled situations. Maybe we go through these tough times, just, just maybe he knows that if we didn't face some fear-filled days, we wouldn't bother with him at all. Or, or, or maybe he allows us to face the dark days to help us to grow. After all, it's in our darkest moments where we often make the greatest discoveries. Even as a seed comes to life more fully after it's pushed into the dark, moist soil and dirt with all that fertilizer. In this life, fertilizer happens. But what we do with it, what we do with the darkness, how we view it, how we break through it, is where we see people who choose to live fearless reach new heights. Or maybe we find ourselves today in darkness at times because it's the fact that we live in a sin-filled and broken world where we've been given free will and unfortunately so has everyone else. Regardless of why we go through the dark days, there is a light available to us. That There is a powerful light available to us. Yet in order for it to shine, we need to take a hold of it. We need to pick it up and we need to actually turn it on, right? And back to free will for a moment. We have the opportunity to take hold of the light today, to turn on a light right now. We, we have an opportunity to tap into the power of prayer, to destroy the darkness and to truly live fearless. So let me take a few more minutes here now to, to teach you to pray effective, bold, powerful prayers that make all the difference. Prayers that will allow you to fully embrace this fearless life that I've been talking about. So many of us have even seen the power of prayer for ourselves. We've, we've uh, heard and we speak of, of the power of prayer that we've seen. We've even experienced the power of prayer, right? And in that moment of experiencing, of seeing God answer a prayer, we knew for sure beyond the shadow of a doubt 
That was prayer. And yet most of these same people, most of us would admit with them that we need to pray more. And we still have so much to learn about prayer. As believers, we have access to this phenomenal power. We we say we believe in it. We whisper a quick prayer here and there. But yet, have you ever wondered, why is it that we tap into that power so much less than we believe we should? Maybe it's because we quickly forget or even gloss over or explain away the positive results of previous prayers. You know, we get the good news and we say things like, I guess the the doctor was better than he realized. The medicine worked faster than they thought it ever could. Or, Or we got lucky this time. Maybe we gloss over some of those good things. Or or we just don't pray more because we've made the mistake in the past of equating a no to our prayer request as an unanswered prayer. Instead of acknowledging the fact that it was answered, just not how we want it. God, give me that new job. Give me that promotion, that raise we cry out. And when it doesn't work out, we think, well, our prayer didn't work. Forgetting that instead, maybe we were simply being protected. 1 Timothy 6.10 reminds us, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Maybe that no wasn't an unanswered prayer at all, but protection from ourselves. Or maybe you found yourself in the past, you prayed for a loved one to be healed. They were were a good person. They were needed. They were wanted. They were loved. And they were loving. It makes no sense. You prayed with all your heart. And instead of getting better, they died. We think, well, clearly our prayer didn't work that time. But God's word says in Isaiah 57 that sometimes the devout are taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. See, God sees further than we see. He knows more than we know. Maybe you've heard someone pray really good before and you think, well, I could never pray like that. Maybe you think God rates us on our vocabulary or or that we need to use just the right terminology. And so you don't bother praying anymore because you know you could never pray as good as so-and-so. So you just set it aside, forgetting how sweet the sound of your own toddler was when they first started to try to say mama or or daddy or explaining what they wanted or needed in the simplest terms psalm 62 8 reminds us that your heavenly father isn't waiting for the right words he wants to hear your words maybe you're not sure what to say when it's time to pray And you get bored with your own prayers, so much so that you're convinced that God must be bored too. See, the enemy wants to keep you from prayer, while your heavenly Father wants to get you to prayer. The enemy wants to convince you that at best, prayer is for someone else, for another time, another place, not for you. And at worst, He would try to convince you that it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't work. But scripture tells us that the prayers of a righteous person, they're powerful, that they're effective. Oh, wait a second. Did you say the prayers of a righteous person? I mean, maybe there's the problem you say. That's why my prayers don't work. I must not be righteous enough. Exactly. We could never be righteous enough or righteous at all. So so you say, that's why my prayers don't work. Listen, if you are depending on your righteousness to come from good behavior, you'd be quite right. 
Scripture is clear. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the perfect goodness of God. We're not righteous apart from the righteousness of God for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reminds us that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, as believers, when we confessed our sin to Jesus and were forgiven for our sin, we were not only adopted into the family of God, we became the righteousness of God. Now, not practically in a behavioral kind of way, but positionally. In the eyes of the living God, we took on the righteousness of Jesus positionally. I and mean, what's all that, that mean? Not practically, but positionally. Think about it this way. There's, there's nothing that my son Cole ever practically did himself to earn his position in our family as my son. Uh, the position was given to him. And regardless of his behavior, I'll always see him as my son. When God looks at the believer, when God looks at you, he does not see the sin that is around you, the behavior that is performed by you, but the righteousness of his son, which is in you. See, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. As a believer, you've got that power. The enemy, the accuser, the father of all lies, he doesn't want you to know this. He doesn't want you to believe this. He'll fill your mind with all sorts of lies. The, the enemy fills your mind if you let him with it's too late for you. It's too late for this to happen. The enemy says, you don't matter. Your prayers don't matter. The enemy says, no one cares about your little problem, your little mess. The enemy says, God won't. And the enemy says, you can't. Now here's what the Bible says about the enemy. John 8, 44 reminds us that there is no truth in the devil. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Oh, listen, don't buy the lie. When the enemy says it's too late, you got to know. The truth is your prayers are never too late. And it's not too late for God to turn things around. God doesn't need to operate on the same timeline as our problems. One touch, one touch of God's favor can move you way beyond what human timing could ever understand. But the Bible says that God is able to do abundantly more than anything we could ever ask or imagine. The enemy says, you don't matter, but the truth is, you do matter. And God considers you the apple of his eye, the work of his hands, his masterpiece. See, the truth is you matter and you are loved and your prayers make a difference because God cares. The enemy says no one cares. But the truth is the only one who really matters cares more for you than you could possibly understand. While you were furthest from him, Jesus cared enough to die for you. He cares for you just the way you are. The Bible says that God demonstrates his own love for you. That while we were still sinners, still at odds with him, still against him, Christ died for us. See, God cares for us and he cares about us and he loves you. In fact, he loves you too much to leave you where you are. We often say he loves you as you are, but too much to leave you where you are. The enemy says God won't do anything, but God says he is, he will, he wants to. The Bible says, ask and it will be given to you. Jesus said, ask anything in my name. I will do it. 
God wants to grant you the desires of your heart. That's what the Bible says. The, the enemy says, no, no, you can't. But God says in his word that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. The Bible says that in Christ Jesus, we already have the victory. The Bible says when we are weak, then we are strong. The Bible says you can. Stop letting the enemy convince you that you can't. That the God won't. That, that no one cares. That, that you don't matter. Or that it's too late, even for prayer. Your prayers matter. So listen, if you can understand anything I'm saying right now, you can pray. You can pray powerful, effective, fearless prayers. Prayerful uh, and powerful prayers start with turning our attention to God. Acknowledging God's presence. Jesus set the pattern for this in his most famous prayer, right? How, how did he start? He said, our Father who art in heaven. How, how did the psalmist pray? Oh God, our Lord and our refuge, our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. They, they first and foremost turn their attention to God. See, we, we need to simply turn our attention to God to open up the power of prayer and to start the conversation. When, when I think um, about the prayers that, that we offer to God, I know that at least two things happen. First and foremost, prayer changes us. And the second is prayer changes our circumstances. First, prayer changing us. It's true that the, the Bible does say that God grants us the desires of our heart. And we love that. But we often skip over the first part of that very same verse. Look at it with me. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, sometimes we need to pray a little longer, don't we, than other times? To, to see the results that we want. And sometimes God changes our hearts. And by the time he answers, we want something different, something better. We want the same things that God would want for us because he hasn't just changed our circumstances, he's changed us. He sees further. He knows better. His perspective is bigger. See, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, when we align our will with God's will, when we learn to want what God wants for us, he'll give you those desires. He'll bless you. Why? To be a blessing. When we're faithful with a little, he will trust us with much. But sometimes our prayers for blessing, for more, need to cause us to first be faithful with what we already have. We're with being a blessing now to others, recognizing how we've already been blessed. See, God wants to change our hearts. Truth is, he cares more about us than our stuff. See, he plans to spend eternity with us, not our stuff. Look at another verse with me, that familiar one you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Jesus said. We like to look upon this as almost a secret formula, and, and if we're not careful, we can easily treat God like some sort of vending machine. If I put in the right amount of change and press the right button, if I ask just the right way, in Jesus' name, I'll get exactly what I want. But that's not what this verse teaches at all. To ask for something in Jesus' name is not a magic incantation. If you were to ask for something in my name, you would be asking for something on my behalf, for something that I also want, have interest in, giving you some authority to get on my behalf. And the same is true for asking in Jesus' name. We need to be able to ask on his behalf. It needs to be more than our selfish desires. It needs to be 
in the best interest of what Jesus would also want. So what would Jesus want? How can I know what he wants? How would I pray? Well, if you read about his life and times in the Gospels, you'll start to get to know him. You'll see what he would want. You'll see that, that he would want you to have the very best life, life to the full. First and foremost, he wants the lost to be found. He wants you to have purpose and meaning to your life. He wants what's best for you and for you to truly have the very best life, but not necessarily the best life defined by our culture or by the marketing department of your favorite brand name. God wants what is truly best for you. He wants what will last for you, what what will help you. So we open the conversation, we open our prayers by turning our attention to God, which frankly is difficult. But we do that and we acknowledge who he is and what he's able to do because that honors him. And it begins to put our mind in the right frame for talking to him. And then we invite him to change us to change our hearts, to forgive us of our sins, to make us into the people he would want us to be. And then, well, we ask him to change our situation, our circumstances. We present our needs to him, believing that all things are possible. We come boldly into the very throne room of God, making our requests known to our heavenly Father, believing that all things are possible. When my teenage son, Cole, again, comes to me and he asks me for something outlandish, huge, crazy, out of this world, it tells me something. I think, who on earth does this kid think that I am? And when he turns himself inside out to ask for something I think he should already know is is his for the taking, it it tells me something else. I think, who on earth does he think that I am? See, your prayers speak volumes to God about how big, how incredible, how powerful, how mighty he is. Don't be afraid to make your requests known to God. His word teaches us to do so. But just as we finish up here, I want you to listen to just a few verses found in Philippians chapter 4. I want you to listen to the wisdom here. Just hold on and and tune into this for a second. Philippians 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, it says. I'll, I'll say it again, Paul writes, rejoice. That was last week's message, right? Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, simply coming to God in prayer, making sure he knows what you need, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That peace, a peace that makes no sense. That's fearless living, right, right there. Living in peace, praying in confidence. Your enemy doesn't want you to do that. But your heavenly Father invites it. Listen, you don't need to be a fanciful prayer. You need prayer. You need to turn your attention to God. Two weeks ago, I began inviting you into the daily discipline of spending time alone with God. I said to turn your faith, point your wheels toward Jesus, trust him. I said, start with what you know about God and his greatness. State what you need and stay strong while you wait on him. Then last week, I challenged you to change your words, to speak words of life, to listen carefully to what you're saying, as our words are incredibly revealing. I challenged you to speak words of life, 
over your situation, your relationships, your finances, whatever it might be. And and now today, I want you to bring it all together. And I want to invite you to ask yourself this simple question. I've heard about some things to try, to do, but have I done anything differently in the last couple of weeks? I've heard some messages, but have I applied them? We've been given a light in the darkness. We've been given something powerful. We need to turn that light on. We need to be doers of the word and not only hearers. We need to live more like we were designed to live. So let's get real practical here. What can you actually do with all this information that I've shared? Well, here goes. Here's the challenge for you. This week, will you take seven minutes at seven o'clock in the morning or at night, whatever works for you, take seven minutes in the morning or at night this week every day to turn your attention to God or take six minutes at six o'clock, five minutes at five o'clock, whatever works for you. But decide right now, be committed, be disciplined. Decide, I'm gonna give my attention to God. I wanna access this power. I wanna turn it on. I wanna tap into it. See, there is a light. Will you turn it on? What will you turn your attention to God this week? Will you sit in silence and pray every day? Not just a safe prayer of thank you God for this or that or a repetitive prayer that you've memorized, but a personal prayer in your own words for just a few minutes. Will you? Will you turn your attention to God? Invite him to change your heart? Ask him to change your situation? Thank him for what he's already doing? Let me help you. Let's pray together right now. Oh God, our God, my loving God and heavenly Father, you've got my attention. We're living in an uncertain world and you've got my attention. I need you, I want you, I acknowledge you. But first, I invite you to change me. Father, forgive me for so many times trying to do things my way instead of your way. Change me, oh God. Make me into the person you would want me to be. Help me just to remember to tap into your power, God. God, you know the uncertainty of my situation. You know what my relationships need. You know what my finances need. You know what my health needs. You know what, you know my needs. You know the darkness that feels like it's closing in on me. But I know you surround me. I know that you uphold me. I know that you give me the victory. I am done listening to the enemy and I am ready to tap into the power of the living God. I acknowledge that you are God, that you are good, that you are large, that you are in charge. And I thank you for what you're already doing. I thank you for what you're doing in me and around me, through me. I thank you for the power that you've given to me through this prayer. Thank you that I can live a fearless life in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever put your money into a vending machine and had an item get stuck? You did what you thought you needed to do and you still didn't get what you were hoping for. Well, it's so important to hear what Pastor Kevin challenged us with today. Understanding God isn't like a vending machine. We don't always get what we hope uh, we would from it. And sometimes he has another plan. I love hearing from all of you in the live chat comments, Uh, but would you do me a favor and leave a comment in the comment section under this video when this live video is finished? I would love to hear what you appreciated today, or maybe share how God spoke to you specifically today. Or again, just leave me a thumbs up. Whatever it is, I look forward to our continued conversation over there. And also, as you move on with your day, find time today, this week, where you can sit in silence each day. Is it seven minutes at 7 a.m., p.m., six minutes at six, five at five? Whatever it is for you, make it a priority this week. And if you need a quiet place to meet, Monday evenings at the Miramichi site, 6.30 to 7.30, is a quiet drop-in prayer time each and every week. Well, thanks so much for joining us for another week of The Point Online. May God bless you more than you can ever imagine.